This is the Judean desert. It has separated Israel and Jordan since these countries were founded. In May of 1995, a flight of 31 general aviation airplanes traversed this foreboding barrier and helped bridge the ideological, cultural, and religious chasm that has existed for centuries. It was the first time since the birth of Israel and Jordan that any airplane, civil or military, has been allowed to take off in one country and land in the other. This is the story of that unprecedented flight. Your host is TWA Captain Barry Schiff, a well-known general aviation enthusiast and popular aviation writer for AOPA Pilot Magazine. Barry, you've got the controls. Welcome to the Middle East. I'm standing on the Mount of Olives, which overlooks the ancient city of Jerusalem. The city is more than 3,000 years old and is sacred to three religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. When the State of Israel was established in 1948, Jerusalem was supposed to have been an international city. But during the War of Independence in that same year, the Jewish quarter was captured by Jordanian forces and the new Israeli-Jordanian border literally cut the city in half. But during a brief six-day flash of history in 1967, Israeli paratroopers surrounded and quickly occupied the entire city. The Six-Day War returned to Israel the holiest site in Judaism, the Western Wall. This limestone structure is believed to be the last remains of the Second Temple, which was destroyed 2,000 years ago. It is also called the Wailing Wall and is the focal point of an outdoor synagogue. Considering the hostility that has existed between Arab and Jew, it seems ironic that one of the holiest sites in Islam, the Dome of the Rock Temple, is situated in such close proximity to the Western Wall. But hostility is beginning to yield to peace. In 1979, Israel and Egypt signed a peace treaty. And in 1994, King Hussein of Jordan signed a peace treaty with Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful, I thought, if general aviation could somehow be used to participate in the Middle East peace process. After all, the distance between Jerusalem and Amman, the capital of Jordan, is only 40 miles. It barely qualifies as a cross-country flight. But the political and cultural chasm is much broader and would be much more difficult to hurdle. Nevertheless, I was determined to try. With the assistance of ex-FAA Administrator Najib Halabi, who just happens to be the king's father-in-law, I was delighted to eventually learn that King Hussein was receptive to the idea of a fly-in between Israel and Jordan. The official invitation from King Hussein came in the form of a letter from the royal court. It was signed by Prince Faisal, who was a squadron commander and F-5 pilot in the Jordanian Air Force. The intense planning for this historic flight came to a head at 7 o'clock in the morning on May 23, 1995. This is when I briefed the 56 Americans who had come to Israel to participate in this remarkable event. Assisting me was an Israeli pilot, Ariel Atzil. The 48 Israeli pilots and their passengers had been briefed in Hebrew the previous evening. I'll put the registration numbers of the airplanes because everything is fixed. We know uh, which aircraft and which formation. Uh, you will be f uh, finding the aircrafts already parked in this uh, order that they're going to line up. First to line up, last uh, to take off. We discussed some of the applicable flight rules in Israel. For example, all flights are controlled VFR. Civilian pilots must fly within established corridors and only with a clearance and while under radar control. For the most part, though, the rules in Israel and Jordan are very much the same as in the States. We'll be flying in groups of four aircraft. Each group of four will be assigned a color code, blue, red, white, whatever, and only the lead aircraft will make communications for the four aircraft in his formation. Aircraft within the formation will be known as, for example, Blue 1, Blue 2, Blue 3, Blue 4. So if there's a problem and an individual aircraft needs to identify himself for some reason, he'll identify himself by first the color and then his position, 
within the formation. We also discussed the weather. Although it would be clear all the way to Amman, it would be quite hazy on the Israeli side of the border. The area was experiencing a heat wave too. Jerusalem's density altitude could pose a problem to those flying some of the older and heavily loaded Cessna 172s. So we worked out a plan to distribute passengers and pilots according to their weight. In this way, none of the aircraft would be loaded with heavyweights. Everyone was advised to bring along only the lightest overnight bag possible. We also discussed protocol and how to address royalty. Now, just in case, we might have the opportunity to meet either King Hussein or Prince Faisal. But a king is referred to as his majesty, and a prince is referred to as his highness. If you have an opportunity to chat with either, and I'm certain that we'll meet uh, Prince Faisal, you refer to him as your highness. I've been led to believe by uh, Naji Pallaby, who is a uh, previous FAA administrator in the United States and also the father-in-law of uh, His Majesty, uh, that both the king and the prince are very, very informal, and once you meet, they might even suggest that you drop some of the, uh, the titles. But unless you're given permission to do so, uh, we would all be advised to use the titles Your Majesty and Your Highness. At the insightful suggestion of King Hussein, Jordanians also were invited to participate in the fly-in. So as we conducted our briefing at the Hyatt Hotel, five Jordanian light planes were landing at Jerusalem's Atarot Airport. They were greeted there by representatives of the Israeli Civil Aviation Authority and the Israeli Association of General Aviation. The Jordanians were then taken to a reception hosted by Israeli President Azar Weizmann at his residence. This is where all of the Americans, Israelis, and Jordanians participating in Operation Peace Flight were to meet for the first time. But before we could gain admission to the residence, there was, of course, a matter of security, which, by necessity, is pervasive throughout the country. The grounds, of course, are beautiful, befitting a presidential residence. The Jordanian pilots arrived shortly after we did, now those are general aviation uniforms, not airline uniforms. President Weizmann was the last to arrive in the reception room, which was an exciting moment for everyone there, the Americans, the Israelis, and perhaps most of all, the Jordanians. Although I had met the president once before, I was no less nervous this time. It was my responsibility, and admittedly my deepest pleasure, to introduce our international group to him. I then briefed him on Operation Peace Flight, although I suspect he knew more about the flight than he pretended to know. As an aside, he seemed particularly fascinated with the large number of American lady pilots in our group. There are very few in Israel. Prior to leaving the States, my good friend, astronaut Jay Apt, sent me a beautiful satellite photo to present to President Weizmann. It was taken during one of Jay's flights in the space shuttle and showed the Jerusalem Amman area in stunning detail. You could even see the airports in both of the capital cities. Jay had also given me additional copies for King Hussein and Prince Faisal, just in case we were to meet them. Also addressing the group was Chaim Eshed of the Israeli Association of General Aviation, which is a member of the International Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. Dr. Eshed also is one of Israel's leading space scientists. Ahmed Jwaiber al led the Jordanian flight from Amman to Jordan. Now this seems appropriate. He is Director General of the Jordanian Civil Aviation Authority. Everyone found him to be extraordinarily charming, as gracious a man as you could ever hope to meet. President Weizmann used to be a Spitfire pilot and once commanded the Israeli Air Force. He spent several minutes discussing with us the camaraderie of those who fly and how our common passion for flight brought us together for this magnificent event. He emphasized that it doesn't matter who holds the stick or through which country's airspace we fly, aviation is universal, and it seemed appropriate that it should have brought us all together on this historic day. He also expressed his regret at not being able to go himself. After the reception, Marvin Ackerman, one of the American pilots, presented a plaque to President Weizmann amid a crush of reporters and television crews representing the international media. This is when it began to sink in 
that what we were doing was really news. This was to be no ordinary flight. It was to establish an aerial connection between two former enemies who now sought peace. Being a part of such an event was exciting beyond description. After the presidential reception, the Jordanian pilots were taken on an emotional tour of the old city. Jordan, Jordan, Shalom, Jordan, Shalom, Aleichem, Shalom, 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 Jerusalem and its Muslim holy sites have been off limits to Jordanians since the Six Day War in 1967. As a result, most of the Jordanian pilots either had never been to the Dome of the Rock Mosque or were too young to remember ever having been there. Most of them reacted with silent contemplation. A few cried unabashedly. Yair Mazur of Ami Travel took the Jordanians for an up-close and personal look at the Western Wall. A few were surprised to learn that anyone, no matter what his religion, was allowed to walk up to the wall. The only requirement is that a hat be worn. After visiting the Wailing Wall, the Jordanians were then taken on a relaxed stroll through the Arab quarter. After completing their tour of Jerusalem, the Jordanians were taken to the hotel to join the rest of us. During lunch, one of the Jordanian pilots told me he had logged 3,500 hours, but that the flight to Jerusalem had been his most exciting. After the flight assignments were determined, each American pilot checked the scheduling board to see which airplane he had been assigned and who his passengers were going to be. The view from atop Jerusalem's terminal building was incredible. Beyond the flags of all three participating countries were 28 American-made airplanes and three built in Europe. But they were all emblazoned with Israeli and Jordanian registration markings, 4X standing for Israel and JY representing the Kingdom of Jordan. Never before had there been such a mix of Israeli and Jordanian aircraft together on the same ramp. All of them had been arranged according to their departure sequence and were poised for a most remarkable flight. I had been selected to command the lead airplane, this Britain Norman Islander, 4X Alpha Yankee Hotel. Everyone gathered for the final briefing in the small terminal building at Jerusalem's Atorat Airport. The details were at first given in Hebrew and then later in Arabic and English. The electricity in the air was so thick that you could almost cut it with a knife. But everyone did their best to appear calm, trying to appear as if this was just another flight. Prior to leaving home for the Middle East, I had special patches made to commemorate the peace flight, and I gave one to each of the 127 participants. Uh, 
it, it was really bedlam in that terminal building, except to those who could hear the speeches and instructions above the din of Arabic, English, and Hebrew. It was remarkable to observe these former enemies talking about flying as if they had been lifelong friends. The Jordanian pilot is on the left and the Israeli on the right. Part of the briefing involved discussing the departure procedures. Takeoff was to be made from runway 30, followed by a left turn toward the southeast and over the city of Jerusalem. It seems as though everybody who was anybody came out to the airport to share in the festivities, including Ehud Ulmert, the mayor of Jerusalem. It was heartening to listen to the mayor and the director general of the Jordanian Civil Aviation Authority discussing the possibility of joining Jerusalem and Amman with some sort of commuter airline service. You would never know that such intense hostility had ever existed between their countries. Density altitude was a major concern. Even though the elevation of Jerusalem airport is only 2,500 feet, the temperature on the runway was about 110 degrees, which resulted in a density altitude of more than 6,000 feet. Probably 22 inches for you. About 22 uh, gallons per hour. I'll have about 12 gallons per hour, because normally on a cold zero level thing we have. Because the aircraft would depart in groups of four and form loose formations when airborne, it was important for each pilot to thoroughly understand what was expected of him during a group takeoff. At approximately 45 minutes before departure, 127 Jordanians, Israelis, and Americans were on the ramp, preparing 31 aircraft for departure. There were 23 singles and eight twins. To further the purpose of Operation Peace Flight, many of the Jordanians elected to fly with Israeli pilots and vice versa. According to the airport manager, Jerusalem Airport had never before been the host to such a concentration of civil aviation activity. I could only wonder what his reaction would be to spending a day at Oshkosh during an EAA convention. Months of planning are over, and the time is here. We start engines at exactly 4 p.m. Middle East time. We have the frequencies handy for market. The twins are to be the first to depart. My formation is to consist of two Piper Aztecs, a Cessna 340, and of course the Britain Norman Islander that I'm flying. The first Aztec is commanded by Menachem Sharon head of Israel's Civil Aviation Administration. The head of the Jordanian Civil Aviation Authority is in the 340. <laughs> I can assure you that there will be no violated regulations on this flight. The Islander is loaded with 10 people, camera equipment, and baggage. Considering the heat, we're departing with minimum fuel, just enough to make the 40-mile flight to Amman and return. While taxing out, we go through the checklist twice. <laughs> This is probably more due to nervous energy than necessity. The excitement reaches a feverish pitch. Accompanying me in the right seat is Ariel Adzil, an Israeli pilot who will handle communications in Hebrew should this become necessary. Out of courtesy, the Jordanian Cessna 340 is allowed to make the first takeoff from Jerusalem. We lift off from runway 30 at exactly 4.12 in the afternoon. We're on our way from Israel to the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan.
Our departure overflies some of the hills north of the city. Our initial routing requires gaining altitude and then flying over the southern part of Jerusalem for noise abatement purposes. I begin to wonder what people on the ground are thinking as they see all of these aircraft leaving Jerusalem and heading for Israel's eastern border. They must know that something special is going on, and they're right. Israel control clears us to climb to and maintain 5,000 feet, and the islander struggles to comply. Menachem Sharon of the CAA pulls up on my right, while the other Aztec slides in from the left. The Jordanian 340 approaches from behind to complete the diamond formation. Ariel and I are now leading the pack. We are crossing over the southern suburbs of Jerusalem. The Dome of the Rock Mosque is one of Jerusalem's most easily identifiable landmarks. It stands out even in thick haze. To our right and ahead is the Judean Desert. And if you look carefully, you can see the Dead Sea, which is 1,300 feet below sea level, the lowest point on Earth. According to the chart, we're approaching Jericho, our last checkpoint in Israel. This is about as close as we're going to get to the Dead Sea. And it's as close as I want to get. The temperature down there is more than 120 degrees in the shade. Jericho is passing on the left. This is where the walls came tumbling down. Jericho is more than 10,000 years old, the oldest city in the world. We're approaching the Jordan River and a checkpoint established especially for our flight. It is appropriately named Salam, which is a five letter abbreviation for Salam, which is the Arabic word for peace. We're over the Jordan River which had represented some of the most restricted and dangerous airspace in the world. Pilots of both countries had to avoid crossing this frontier unless they wanted to serve as target practice for hostile jet fighters. We are now over Jordan flying an Israeli registered airplane. The mere thought of it boggles the mind. Below is the Jordan River Valley, which contains some of the most fertile farmland in Jordan. According to our chart, the city nestled against the foothills is El Karama. Ever since crossing the river, the radio has been nothing but incessant chatter. Someone said in quiet contrast that this is as if God's breath were lifting our wings. Ariel and I once again read the restriction applying to aircraft entering Jordan. This restriction, I have been told, will not appear in the next revision. Another Berlin Wall has crumbled. Over the radio, we also hear several Israelis claiming to be the first to use their cellular phones to call home from over Jordan. Miracles seem to be happening right and left. Soon the chatter subsides and everyone seems to be in silent contemplation of the miracle that is enveloping us all. As we begin to cross the hills west of Amman, we call Amman Tower. The female controller clears us to descend to traffic pattern altitude and enter a right-hand pattern for runway 24. The airport should be straight ahead, but neither Ariel nor I can find it. Because this would not be the time to get lost, I pull out the approach plate for Amman's Marka International Airport. I find the frequency for the Amman VOR and tune the receiver to 116.3. We are now heading directly for the final approach fix for the active runway. Moments later, we are over the western suburbs of Amman, and the 10,800-foot-long runway finally comes into view. My co-pilot, Ariel, doesn't know it yet, but I've got a surprise up my sleeve. Because I'm the leader of the flight and made the takeoff, he naturally expects me to make the landing. But somehow, 
It just doesn't seem right that an American pilot should make the first landing of an Israeli airplane in Jordan. So, it is my plan to relinquish the controls to him just before landing. Amman is a much larger city than I had imagined, but I suppose it should be large. Half of all Jordanians live here. It is hard not to notice that most of the houses are the same color white. I was later told that this is in compliance with a municipal law that requires buildings to be faced with local stone. I understand that there's a similar law in Jerusalem. Look at that beautiful mosque. As we enter the downwind leg, I mentally go through my gump checklist. Let's see now, the fuel is selected properly, fuel pumps are on, the undercarriage is, well, it's welded down, mixtures are rich, and oh yeah, props to go. I'll save that for a short final. And then a final check to make sure that everyone has their seat belts fastened. It's hard to believe that this is really happening after all those months of planning. Oh yeah, before I forget, props full forward. Darn, Ariel has his legs crossed. Oh well, he can handle it. Hey, Ariel, I say, you wanna land it? As we taxi toward the ramp, I notice Ariel slowly shaking his head. What's the matter, I ask. He continues to shake his head and says, this can't be happening. This can't be real. Do you believe this? He continues to shake his head. All together. Doesn't matter. Simply making the flight was incredible enough, but to have been met on the ramp by King Hussein caught everyone off guard. Some of our group thought they were suffering heat prostration as the king approached them. Others were convinced that the man was a stand-in. But the king made everyone feel welcome and at ease, despite our casual appearance. How is everything great? It was wonderful. It was wonderful. That's good. It is a shame that we were not able to capture it on video, but at one point, an Israeli, obviously overcome by the emotion of the moment and sobbing with joy, walked toward King Hussein with outstretched arms, as if to embrace the king. Two strapping guards standing behind the monarch reacted reflexively and began to move forward in a protective manner, but they were stopped short as the king held out his arms in return. The guards stepped back and the taller of the two could not withhold his tears. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Your Majesty, Wings for Peace has arrived for you. This is from 280,000 people in South Florida presenting you with this plaque for the uh, for everything that you've done to, for, for peace. Thank you very, very much. And I want sir. you to accept that with our best regards. Thank you so much. Uh, very well. You Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And my deepest appreciation to all our friends. And it was so exciting and so wonderful to think that general aviation makes this possible. Flying makes it possible. Thank you. It's really... It is. It's, 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 it, it creates a, a brotherhood that keeps all men together and women who fly. And, and we who share wings share everything. It's a, it's a wonderful friendship that it allows.
Um, I'm glad it was a day we had an opportunity to, uh, to do this and kind of uh, work out everything. Perfectly. <laughs> well, At some point, it just seemed like so far, so long ago, we started the whole thing. I know. It, uh, this will come together. it has been a long time, but it's been wonderful. And it makes it all worthwhile. It's uh, wonderful to, to finally meet you. An Israeli pilot, Eli Inbar, said that it was wonderful seeing the Jordanians this way. In the past, he said that he had only seen them through the sights of his rifle. Inbar's father, by the way, had been killed in battle against the Jordanians. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. I stood back on the ramp and observed these former enemies laughing and embracing. And it seemed so natural. I wondered how these warm people could ever have been at war. They have so much in common, so much to fight for, not against. And general aviation was the catalyst for this proud moment. After everyone had arrived and been greeted by King Hussein, we were taken to a reception room at the airport where he formally addressed our group. We belong to a very special group of people. Whenever we've had the privilege of flying or do so, we face the same challenges. We have had to go through the same disciplines. And there is an affinity between us all that we all recognize and have always recognized. But this comes also within the context of the breaking down of walls and barriers that have separated human beings from each other. And although it should be very, very normal, I believe it's always a surprise when we realize that we are just the same. Our hopes and aspirations, the challenges we face, the desire we have to make a contribution for a better future for those who are to follow us. During his speech to members of the peace flight, King Hussein said, Today you have made history. As you know, the distance you have flown is not a very long one. And I hope and pray that the distance will become even shorter with the passage of time. I never sought peace between only governments and leaders. But a peace between the people is a true peace and the only one that can last. There is no other way to carry out our obligations to future generations. You are pioneers in the peace process, and I want to thank you. Everyone in the audience was deeply and profoundly touched by what the king had said. Each member of the peace flight was given a small gift from King Hussein. But the most precious gift that he gave to us and to the rest of the world is the one of which he is most proud, his peace treaty with Israel. Each of us also received a book containing the treaty and related documents in both English and Arabic. Actually, uh, started in the power in uh, 1916 with the Arab revolution against the Turks. After the reception with King Hussein, we were taken to our hotel for some badly needed refreshing. That evening, Prince Faisal hosted a magnificent dinner at Khan Zaman, which in Arabic means once upon a time. Khan Zaman is a renovated 19th century complex of stables and warehouses that has been converted into a first-class restaurant with some of the finest food that Amman has to offer. The next morning, we were treated to a tour of Mount Nebo and Amman itself. But rather than my trying to tell you everything we saw, settle back and enjoy some of the sights with us.
When we returned to the airport for departure, Prince Faisal was on hand to bid us farewell. Like I said, you've only just seen a very small, yeah. small aspect. Yeah. I'm not a pilot, but I want to tell you the graciousness of the European man, your father, and the people in your country. Just for the short time that we've been here, it's just special. Everyone, I'm so pleased to say thank you so very much. I think hopefully the friendships that have been made here uh, between the Americans, the Israelis, and Jordanians will be a symbol of the potential for peace in our region and between our peoples. Uh, I have nothing more to add than to wish you Godspeed and a good safe landing home. And uh, we won't be happy until everybody's back in Jerusalem on the ground safely. So good luck and I hope you enjoy your flight back. We recrossed the Jordan River, this time from east to west, from Jordan to Israel. Operation Peace Flight seemed to have ended almost as quickly as it had begun. And there again was the Judean desert, unchanged since the day before, yet changing constantly. After being cleared to descend from our cruising altitude of 6,000 feet, we were soon on a straightened approach to Jerusalem's runway 30. As we landed, the rest of the 24 Israeli aircraft came home to roost. Everyone made it safely, as if in compliance with Prince Faisal's wish. Our flight was given little advanced publicity in the Middle East because there are enemies of peace shackled by the chains of the past. There was no reason to give them an opportunity for sabotage. But afterward, the electronic and print media spread this remarkable story worldwide. Israeli television was first to air the good news. An unprecedented flight in the Middle East today. 30 light planes flown by pilots from Israel, Jordan, and the United States flew from Jerusalem in Israel to Amman, the capital of Jordan. It was the first civilian flight ever conducted between the two former enemies. Called Operation Peace Flight, the venture began at Jerusalem's Atarot Airport where the pilots gathered for the historic event. It ended 30 minutes later at Marka Airport in Amman, Jordan. Before takeoff, the pilots were treated to a special reception held in their honor. Hello. 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 Nice to meet you. How are you? Hello. Barry Schiff. Airline captain Barry Schiff of Transworld Airlines organized and led this historic flight. Flying clubs in Israel and Jordan had the support of Jordan's King Hussein and Israeli President Azar Weizmann. Both men are pilots themselves. The airspace between the two countries has been open to commercial traffic for several months, but for reasons of security, no civilian flights had ever taken place before today. More than 100 Israeli, Jordanian, and American pilots flew from Jerusalem to Amman on a so-called peace flight this week. The gesture was made in support of Middle Eastern unity. Jordan Television has more. When distances between people and countries could be bridged, barriers eliminated, then peace can take its two between people as well as governments. Symbolizing the friendly border established by last year's Jordan-Israel peace treaty, a historic and a unique event took place between the two countries. A joint civil flight between Amman Airport and Kalandia Airport in Jerusalem was organized as the first peace flight between the two countries. The peace flight started from Amman with five white Jordanian aircraft carrying 23 pilots and people interested in aviation. And for the first time in 27 years, Jordanian aircraft landed in Jerusalem Airport 
where they were received by Israeli pilots and officials. وفي رحلة العودة من مطار قلنديا إلى مطار عمان المدني كان المشهد أكثر جمالا فبالإضافة إلى الطائرات الأردنية الخفيفة الخمس انضمت 32 طائرة خفيفة أمريكية وإسرائيلية إلى الفريق تقل ما مجموعه 128 شخصا وحلقت الطائرات جميعها ما بين مطاري قلنديا وعمان لتحط في مطار عمان المدني مندوبنا محمد الوكيل رافق الرحلة وأعد التقرير التالي قال جلالة الملك الحسين خلال لقائه مجموعة من الطيارين الأردنيين والأمريكيين والإسرائيليين لدى وصولهم إلى مطار عمان المدني بعد قيامهم برحلة جوية من مطار قلنديا إلى مطار عمان إن هذه الرحلة هي تأكيد على أن المسافات On our last night in Israel, we threw ourselves one heck of a party as a final tribute to Operation Peace Flight. It was held in a restaurant overlooking the ancient port of Jaffa, which is on the Mediterranean immediately south of Tel Aviv. Following dinner, I presented each of the participants with a special first flight certificate to memorialize their participation in Operation Peace Flight. And the person responsible for the calligraphy, the beautiful handwriting on your certificates, Captain Catherine McPherson. But the most important items that we took home were the memories of friends made, not only among ourselves, but also in Israel and Jordan. And then there will always be the memory of having contributed in some small way to help bring the people of Israel and Jordan together by making the first flight ever between these two wonderful countries. This unprecedented general aviation flight helps to prove a Middle East adage, which states simply that those who don't believe in miracles are simply unrealistic.